Good evening, Zero Project community. I'm delighted and glad that you joined us for our session tonight on career entry points for persons with disabilities. This is going to be a really exciting session where we'll get to hear both from programs, which are placing persons with disabilities into meaningful internships, which as we all know is the foundation and at the start of a sustainable and independent career. And we'll also hear from directly from the participants who've gone through those programs who will relay their experiences and their um, successes in the programs which we'll be highlighting from both Ireland and the United States. With that being said, let's jump right into the conversation I had with Lorraine Summers and Marie Devitt, and we'll hear from them about the great programs they've been scaling and they've been managing over the years. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the ZeroCon 21 conference today. Um, it is really my distinct pleasure to have two very exciting and enthusiastic ladies uh, who are making sure that persons with disabilities get the career entry points they all deserve. And uh, we've convened here today under the title Creating Career Entry Points for Persons with Disabilities. And I'm delighted to showcase some two programs, one from Ireland and one from the United States, which are doing outstanding work. Uh, before I have the, the distinct pleasure to introduce both of our speakers today, I'd like to give a brief audio description to those who can not see me, but only hear me. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm a white male. I have short buzzed hair. I have a stubby beard. Uh, a short beard basically. I'm wearing a black blazer and a white button down and I'm very glad that you've joined us uh, today at the ZeroCon 21 um, conference. Without further ado, I would like to start off with uh, the first speaker of tonight, uh, Mary Devitt, who's the Pathway Coordinator for the Trinity Center for uh, People with Intellectual Disabilities. And uh, Mary, where are you calling us from? Oh, uh, hi, Robin. Yeah, so I'm talking to you live from my home in Dublin in Ireland. Um, so it is uh, 4 p.m. here local time. And uh, yeah, very excited to be part of this discussion today. So thanks a million for asking me. And for an audio description, sorry, I forgot. Yes, um, so for joining I'm us. Wearing, ooh, I'm wearing a kind of red colored dress with a, um, a patterned scarf. And I'm a white female with kind of light brown blonde hair. Wonderful. And uh, Mary, please do tell us, uh, give us a perhaps a, a brief foray and a presentation on, on your work and how you are uh, pushing forward the envelope of giving persons with disabilities access to valuable internships, which we all know are really the, the foundation of a modern career today. Perfect. So yes, so as you said, I'm my title, I suppose, is the Pathways Coordinator for the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities. So we run a two-year certificate program for students with intellectual disabilities. And it's a full-time program. Um, so students are with us for up to four days per week. Um, they cover so they cover 22 modules over two years. Um, these, these modules are a very wide variety of kind of subject areas. Um, so they study anything from the arts to STEM subjects. And then in um, second year, they do a focus, a very heavy focus on business subjects. Um, so the idea, the idea of the program really is to give a, a broad education to um, these young people, really to equip them to have the skills and the confidence um, and the self-belief, I suppose, to, to be able to move from Trinity College into either further education or employment afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose what we've added in the past few years is was the missing piece, which is the, an internship program after the two-year course is finished. And so this has been really key to, um, to the success of the program because 
we are we work very closely with um, a number of businesses in Dublin and in Ireland in general um, who support us to run this internship program. So they they support us both in a financial sense and um, by kind of uh, buying into the, the kind of the partnership program, but also um, more importantly, they support us with practical work placements and paid internships for um, for these young people. So really what we've seen is um, a huge transformation in attitudes in companies and um, and also, I would say, confidence and, and success with these uh, young people who come through the programme. So we, we started our internship programme in 2017, and we now have 12 of our graduates who are permanent employees of some very high profile um, companies, you know, companies that you might know like PayPal and um, EY and, you know, and many others. And as well as those 12 permanent employees, we also have a large number of graduates who are still on long term internships. So we'd hope that a lot more of them will convert into permanent roles as well. So it's it's developing, it's growing all the time, and it's it's really, really exciting for us to see the change that's happening. Oh, that is magnificent, Mary. Thank you for, for giving us kind of a first um, glimpse into that. Perhaps uh, in your own words, what has been the, the biggest barrier, the biggest stumbling blocks over the years as you've tried to scale this program? Yeah, so um, I suppose at the beginning, um, it was financial and sustainability of the program. So, you know, we're a very small, um, small part of Trinity College. So while Trinity was very, very supportive of the program for many years, um, we also needed business support to guarantee our longevity, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And so in the early years, financial um, worries were kind of to the forefront, but the more partners who have come on board with us, um, it's sort of success breeds success. So, you know, when we have high profile partners, other companies now, rather than us trying to chase partners, other companies are now coming to us um, and, telling us, you know, we've heard about your program and we'd like to support you as well. So that has been a big change. So the financial, the immediate financial pressure has been taken away, but that was a big, big challenge for us um, in the early days. And it is also obviously a challenge for other programs um, in Ireland and I'm sure around the world that, you know, the funding is really key. Um, we are now kind of, you know, getting support um, from government and we're in discussions to make it more commonplace for, for students with intellectual disabilities to go to university. Uh, because I think the problem was there was no expectation that that was even a need. And, you know, we're showing that not only can they go to university, but they can thrive within a university environment Absolutely. and really succeed very, um, uh, with very uh, fantastic results afterwards. Well, taking the cue of worldwide, I'd like to pivot to someone who, who's been working uh, with scientists and engineers, a fascinating group of people. And um, I'd like to introduce Laureen Summers, the project director of the Entry Point program of the AAAS. Laureen, the stage is yours. Hello, and thank you so much, Robin, for having me. And it's great to be with me. Um, I am Laureen with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I am a white female. Um, I'm wearing a green turtleneck. I have gray hair and um, I have cerebral palsy, which has been a lifelong condition. It has made my life quite interesting. Um, so that, that's a little about me. Um, entry point is the uh, signature program of the project on science 
technology and disability at Triple X. It began in 1996 when my former director was traveling across the country and meeting students who were graduating with high degrees and great skills in science and engineering and not, not finding full employment. Mm -hmm. So talking to many people, we decided that internships, um, like Marie had said, would be a pathway to full employment. It would showcase the skills and interests to prospective employers. Um, our applicants have all kinds of disabilities. Um, and we do a nationwide recruitment of universities all over the country. We get resumes and transcripts and letters of recommendation. We, we screen and refer students to our partner companies. If there is a match between what the company needs and what the student can offer, then a summer opportunity of 10 weeks um, would be offered to the student. Uh, there is no guarantee any student will be placed. And um, many of our students have learning disabilities, mobility disabilities, uh, hearing and vision disabilities, and there are many have been on the Asperger's spectrum. Um, a big concern of mine is building relationships, getting to know the students, getting to know the companies or the university programs which have partnered with us. Mm -hmm. um, they pay an administrative fee uh, for our services of recruiting, screening, and referring, which a lot of potential partners cannot meet the required fee of $5,000 for a company or $1,500 for a university research program. We, we follow the students after the internship. We want to follow them through degree completion and into their career. Um, entry point does not place students in full employment. So um, they're kind of on their own, but in many cases, participating in a research-based internship has provided the opening for them to uh, get offers either from the company itself or another um, institution. Mm -hmm. So the financial part is difficult. 
how many partners have come and go. We're now working with Mayo Clinic, the Aerospace Corporation, Genentech, which is a pharmaceutical uh, site, and about six university programs, uh, which include Cornell, Ohio State, the University of Tennessee, and others. Um, well, that's a little yeah. picture of what we do. Robin, what have I missed? No, you haven't missed anything. That was a really nice uh, comprehensive overview over the entry point program. And I'd like to take something you, you touched upon, the financial uh, limitations and the fact that even the universities, the research programs are not able to, to stomach $1,500 uh, dollars or $5,000. And this, this uh, aligns a bit with what Marie said earlier in the, in the tra tra trajectory of her center that um, she had issues in financial um, problems or problems reaching out and convincing companies to pay a fee, which I understand, Mary, is, is very, very similar to that which Lorene incurs. Yeah, so our, our partners pay um, either 5,000 or 10,000 euro per year. And what we ask is that they sign up for a period of three years so basically almost to sponsor a student through the two years of the course and the one year of graduate internship. So at the beginning, as I mentioned, you know, we have to go out and try and encourage um, companies to, to sign up with us. And we were incredibly lucky um, because we had an ambassador kind of who worked with us, who was a very famous ex-sports um, man, a rugby player for Ireland and a very well-respected businessman. And he took it upon himself to um, contact the, the CEO of a lot of the, of the big companies in Dublin and encourage them with his, his backing to kind of, you know, this is something that they should get involved with. And, you know, he did this completely voluntarily and that's how we kind of got started. So because they knew him, trusted him, they said, well, you know, maybe we'll try this. So now, as I said, we have 34 partners. Um, all of them are with us on three year sort of um, partnership packages, but all of them recently renewed for a further three, which is amazing. Um, uh, and we also have some, uh, you know, we get grant funding as well. So we recently got funding from, um, you know, a government initiative which would match all of our business funding. So we had to have commitments from business. They would give us a certain amount of money and then the government grant matched that again. So that was hugely, um, a hugely powerful message for, for us for sustainability. So it kind of has secured our future. And also it has given us a very high profile amongst these businesses that, you know, the trust is very important you know, they, they came on board and, and said they would try it, but it's up to us then to prove that they made the right decision and, you know, that we we are doing what we said we would do and that, you know, we're there to support them through the internship process as much as we support our young people as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, you know, we spend a lot of time managing the relationships with the businesses and that's really my entire role is the business partnerships and the internships and that um, and it does take a lot of time because you have to build a relationship with each team within each business and um, to get to know them well enough to be able to match the person into the right environment and that's really what's been key so i work very closely with an occupational therapy um, team uh, in our little um in our in our small tcpid team and they prepare the students and support the students and graduates and I sort of support the business and we all work together to make sure each each um, internship is so carefully matched that it is set up for success from the very beginning. 
Yeah. So, so attention to detail really yeah. um, sets you apart. I wanted to go back what you mentioned and perhaps ask the question then that it's not necessarily a financial argument because, you know, from your experience and what I understood, it wasn't that the companies were able to not, you know, put up the 5,000 euros. It was that either they didn't understand the emotional argument or they didn't have the trust and that actually the key to success was not to, to necessarily find 5,000 euros from a funding source, but to find someone who could step in and vouch and make, uh, I think the, well, in the end, of course, also the financial argument, but especially the emotional argument and to build up that trust in order for the companies to, to extend the same amount of trust and to bring in um, persons with disabilities and giving them meaningful um, jobs. And perhaps on that note, then, you know, something I'd, I'd like to discuss with, with Laureen and you, Mary, is um, often, you know, perhaps there are misperceptions about employment for persons with disabilities. People might think that they do predominantly administrative work or work which is, you know, quote unquote, not challenging. And I'd love to hear kind of, you know, maybe some examples from you, Lorena, of a scientist or engineer who went through your program. Maybe you want to talk about him or her and uh, what she actually did, the research she did to show that this, what, what you're doing and the, the opportunities you're creating is truly for highly complex research. Yes. Um... I recently sent out a survey to our alums asking what worked and what didn't work. And I know one student, he um, is in finance and he worked in New York on one of the uh, big financial companies. and. He, he wrote me and said, my supervisor really didn't think I could do the work. He didn't believe my resume. Um, he also had cerebral palsy. And, and the supervisor said, why don't we get someone to really tell you what to do? Another case was a woman um, with a hearing impairment and she ended up getting rejected because the company couldn't figure out how to provide accommodations. Mm -hmm. She needed an interpreter for just for meetings. And, and whereas many companies did provide in this instance, it became problematic. Um, other companies have told me they can't date people in wheelchairs mm -hmm. because they're not accessible. Um, never, nonetheless, there have been many, many successes where people with significant disabilities have really been outstanding and the supervisors and mentors have been really awed by what the interns could do could do and one story is um a student who used a head stick mm -hmm. on the computer he got an internship at nasa mm -hmm. and he's even he doubted his ability whether he would be working very long. He did two internships at NASA. One was wow. figuring out how, how the astronauts could quickly get out of a space shuttle mm -hmm. in case of emergency. 
the student is now at Boeing designing engineer mounts. He recently built a two-story accessible home for himself. So I love, there are many, there are tons of stories like that. And even when there's been difficulties, people have been persistent in working it out. I've come in and said, oh, I'll be right there. I'll be right there to help you. And they'll say, no, 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 we figured it out already. Well, thank you for your endurance and perseverance. I mean, it truly shows and hopefully that, that's also a message which the participants watching uh, take away that these are these are candidates, these are persons with disabilities, which, as you said, go on to do absolutely groundbreaking work, ensuring that astronauts can leave a space shuttle securely. So that is really, uh, really heartening and great to hear. Perhaps, uh, uh, Mary, going from, from, from astronauts to some, more, some of the more business oriented candidates you have been able to place, is, is there someone you'd like to highlight uh, or an experience you'd like to highlight, which really, I think, uh, underlines perhaps something which Laureen said, that it takes two to tango. It takes both the person with disability and the company to put up good faith, to put up um, a, a solid foundation on which they can work on. Because, you know, Laureen, you mentioned the candidate at NASA that even he doubted his abilities. And I think at the end of the day, the reason he was successful, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laureen, was because NASA and he ended up coming together and having faith in both of their capabilities, the capabilities of NASA to support him and vice versa, the, the, the person with disability to have the full faith that his skills are wanted and needed at NASA. And you know, I think that really came together to provide the great story you shared with us, Laureen. So, um, Let's quickly say NASA was a 20-year partner. They were great. We got enough financial aid that I could go to every center during the summer and build those relationships. And I haven't been able to do that with every company because of it money, but it was so great. Relationships are really key. They're everything. Absolutely. And actually, I, that follows on perfectly because I was going to say relationships are <laughs> so key to, to the success of, of our program as well. And the the one-on-one -on -one relationship. So, you know, we for every internship we um, ask the company to provide a mentor uh, to work with our graduate and that mentor is probably the most important person in the whole um the whole operation because obviously you have to have senior management buy-in and support for it but the mentor is the person who will you know welcome our intern in support them as they're doing their work they won't do the work for them, but you know they'll support them. They'll introduce them to colleagues, and it's it's somebody for our graduate to 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 get to know and to trust and to know that they will be there to support them throughout. And the companies have been amazing in that sense. Um, I've so many stories I could tell. You're asking for examples. There's just so many, but um, I know we'll be talking to Steve and Ryan yep. um, later on. Uh, so I may let him tell his own story. Um, he's a fantastic young man. But um, also, he, so Stephen is working in EY, Ernst & Young. So we have, we now have five graduates who are permanent in EY. And that's in a, in a quite a short period of three years. And um, so the very first, very first graduate who EY took on for an internship was a young lady called Margaret. And Margaret had done our course. Um, she had finished the course about eight years previous. And in those eight years, 
um, all she had done was volunteer work and child minding and things like that. And that's something we find hugely is that there's plenty of people willing to offer work, but unpaid work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it gives the impression that it's not valued, that it's not, you're not the same as everyone else, but you know, you can come in, you can do stuff. But so that was really key, um, really shocking to me, I suppose, because Margaret was so incredibly capable and yet had never been given an employment contract for anywhere. So, um, you know, EY were nervous initially getting started with Margaret and probably underestimated what she would be capable of doing. And very, very, very quickly um, realized that she was totally capable and so much so that she took over kind of, she had her own set um, role where she was managing you know, file management for the team. Um, one thing about the company was that it was a, um, essential for every employee to do online training regularly. A lot of companies have that. So Margaret's manager uh, assumed incorrectly that Margaret might might not be able to do the training. Um, and he, he was absolutely proved wrong. She has done every single piece of training um, successfully and achieved over 70% every time. So she completely transformed everyone's opinions and um, which then gave them the confidence to take on another intern. And with each intern, they, they each have gone into different teams and different departments and um, doing very different roles. And um, we have another young man, Mark, who um, is, uh, his, his role is, is kind of working with his team and gathering information from the team each week and then giving a presentation every Friday with the results. And Mark has been asked now to train other teams in how to implement this process in their own. So, so from our interns going in as an intern, they are now training other employees in, in different systems. And I just think that is so such a powerful message um, that you know new interns come in and both Margaret and Mark are involved in training them. And these are not interns with intellectual disabilities. These are interns um, from all walks of life. Yeah. And it's not training on disability, it's training on the work. Yeah, and I think you know, that really shows that unlike the perception, persons with, with disabilities are not a burden, but they're a multiplier. They amplify those with and without disabilities and help to bring out the best in others. And I think that's really a, a key lesson to take um, here. Uh, and then, you know, you know, you also stressed uh, the fact that still today, persons with disabilities as a career demographic, let's say, are completely underrepresented and are completely underutilized in what they can actually do. Their skill set, um, you know, being given, um, as you said, with Margaret, you know, menial tasks or administrative tasks, which were not on par with, with her capabilities. So I, I was wondering, and maybe to, to, to close out our, our conversation here and take it into the live Q&A, if you had the opportunity now, if say if you were out and about with a mask and you got onto the elevator and you, you met your prime minister, uh, Michael Martin, what would you like to tell him? What should he know about the work you do? And what should he know about uh, career chances and opportunities for persons with disabilities? Well, I would love to have the opportunity to meet <laughs> Michael Martin, and I, if he's listening, uh, I, I can set up a meeting. But um, obviously, uh, the main thing is that um, you know we want to focus on the ability, and as you said, the you know the contribution that people with intellectual disabilities can bring to the workplace and to society, and you know we want the government um, to support similar type of programs throughout the country, but also to encourage um, encourage society and, you know, perhaps by employing people with intellectual disabilities themselves within, um, within the government uh, roles to, to help change people's attitudes to opening opportunities um, and, and creating a, a society where everyone is given the same chance to get an education, to go to university, to get a job, and to be paid uh, accordingly for that job. 
and also you know the thing that we that has uh, we've got to the point now is to be promoted within your job and you know to, to go to management level and and that kind of thing and um, because nobody has ever had those expectations um for these young people and you know we're showing through this program and other fantastic programs that all these people need is to be given a chance to show what they can do um and you know we need the government and companies to support us in that so Yes, I hope to meet Michal Martin and tell him that in person soon, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> now, now, now Lorene, you, you, you accidentally bump into Joe Biden in the elevator um, in Washington, D.C. What, what do you tell him? I would say, please include disability in your conversation about unity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So often people talk about race, gender, class, etc. Mm -hmm. I do not want to be the etc. anymore. We all bring unique life experiences and coping skills to um, any kind of internship or employment. And we just really want to build the relationships, especially in science and engineering, that we will work of our contribution to the whole landscape. That is truly a beautiful message, I think, to, to end on, Laureen. Persons with disabilities should not be, et cetera. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing the two of you right now in, in the live Q&A. And um, yeah, see you on the other screen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Robin. Right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the ZeroCon 21 conference. You just heard our conversation with Lorena and Marie, who really did a great job in describing the programs they run the hurdles they face, but of course also the success stories they've had. And kind of on the note of success story, Marie, thank you for bringing in a great uh, guest here, namely Stephen Ryan from EY, who, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, is a graduate of your wonderful program. That's correct. He's, he's one of our, our top graduates, um, finished in, remind me, Stephen, 2019, right? Yeah, yeah 2019, yeah. Wonderful. Um, Stephen, perhaps uh, in your own words, could you maybe outline your story with, with the Trinity Center and how you came to meet Marie and your experiences with the program? Yeah, I would. Um, um, hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Ryan, and I come from um, Leash, which is, situated, which is uh, located an hour from Dublin, capital of Ireland. And um, well, when I left um, my training course, um, National Learning Network, I had no education or no background for two years. So I was alone on my own for two years I'm at home. But then I was went to Dublin just for a day out with my friend. And when um, I came back to, when I came back, my mom told me, my aunt who works in Trinity College in Dublin, told me of this great course. I was um, late for registration so we had to gather all of the references and the doctor letters in one day. And we handed it to my aunt that night and she brought it up to Dublin for us. And then the next day I had an interview for Trinity. And um, it was a very nerve wracking day because I was an hour and a half late for the interview because my train broke down. And, um, but I just continued on like nothing happened once I got there. Marie was one of the people who interviewed me. And then the next day I got word that I got accepted under this great course. The course is um, the course is for people with intellectual disabilities and it has 22 subjects over the two years. And these range from film studies all the way to learning about the rights for people with disabilities, which I found very interesting. And then on the second term of year two of the course, it's a two year part-time, two year part-time transitioning into full-time in the second year. And um, 
which is um, a work experience, work placement. And I got work placement in Ernest & Young in Dublin, um, which I found it was over eight weeks every Friday for um, a couple hours each Friday. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. The team there was so supportive. Everyone is given one body in EY. And my body was Neve Parsons, which um, she wanted me to mention her. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so she um, helped me develop as a person, but developed me as a worker in EY, which was, um, I found very great to have in her as a body. And then at the end of the eight weeks of work placement, I got worried, I got a summer internship in EY. And like the summer internship is over three months and it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it and I really, really didn't want to go. But then I found out I didn't have to go because on the 19th of August, 2019, my birthday, I got word that I was made permanent in EY, which was a day I would never forget. As I finally found, apart from Trinity, of course, I finally found a place I belonged, a place that treated me for a person without the disability, just as an equal, which was really big for someone with a disability. Um, and like in my experience in EY, you're given one body, but in my experience, the whole team was my body because everybody was willing to help each other, which was really great. And they all treated me as an equal and treated me as a person, which I found very, very great. Well, Stephen, that is a wonderful story, and I think it shows uh, that, that your perseverance really paid off. You know, your train broke down for one and a half hours, but you, you, you powered through. You, you gave yourself the confidence you needed and, uh, you know, really hats off to you and to Marie. And perhaps you could tell our audience a bit more in detail the, the kind of work you do right now at EY at Ernst & Young. Well, yes, like, um, well, I'm actually in the last couple of months, I was made kind of like a kind of management of their whole department list. So whenever someone new comes into the department, I have to add them onto the list mm -hmm. and add them what them, like we call them CFTs, which is kind of a family tree within EY, so I think, that you're given work um, from, you can only do work from your CFT and um, it, it lowers the work on other people because some people were getting too much work from all different people. So it kind of like it um, consists of a boss and seniors all the way down to seen where I am, the associate. Mm -hmm. And then I do reports. I run reports for this, um, which are kind of like, um, like databases for the clients. And it, it's kind of like the reports updates the information from the clients. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm not mistaken, the onboarding you do for everyone, that's both persons with and without disabilities, correct? Yes. Wonderful. So really actual true responsibility. And I think, uh, Marie, that's something you, you strive in your program to not only um, connect persons with disabilities to internships, but to connect them to actual meaningful work, not administrative work, not work in which, you know, the skills which the, all persons with disabilities have are completely undervalued. Exactly. And, it, you know, in, in particular, in the case of Stephen, so EY told us that they, you know, that they would, would take on a student for a placement, but they were very specific that this student would have to have quite um, high level computer skills. So we knew in advance that the person would have to have great attention to detail, you know, to be able to use Excel um, and, and all of that. So we knew immediately, there was no question Stephen was the right match for that team. And, you know, he has, I'm so proud of him. He has surpassed all of our expectations in there. And, uh, you know, what he didn't say was that he went on a summer internship which was supposed to be three months, but he was made permanent after only two months uh, in there. So that is the quickest, quickest we have ever had a graduate receive a permanent contract. 
Um, so it's a record that I don't know if we'll ever break because it's just such a success story. And it's all down to, you know, Stephen has worked so hard um, and has shown everybody the fantastic um, skills that he, that he has. And he's just moving up and up within the team and we're incredibly proud of him. Wonderful, Stephen, again, really uh, compliments. Laureen, do you have a story perhaps you would like to share with Stephen of some of the students you've been able to place at internships and kind of the career paths they have gone on to um, pursue? Sure. Um, one of the things we like to do is we like to go back and follow the intern. So we follow them to see if they completed their education and receive their degree. Many go on to their graduate work and we want to know what they do. And so, in fact, I just heard from an intern the other day who worked at NASA. And she has cerebral palsy like I do. But she said, following the internship, much like you, she got hired at NASA permanently. And I think she's been there around maybe 10 years now. And her work is so technical, I don't understand it. <laughs> uh, I do all this work, but I'm not a scientist. Other people have become software engineers. Um, a bunch are managing programs where they work. Um, a few have worked in disability related fields. So I try to get them on my advisory committee to tell me what to do. Um, one woman is working at Intel and, the, and she's a process engineer. But don't ask me what that means. <laughs> uh, so um, people have done amazing things and the stories are great. Stephen, like you, they worked with a team of people and they made friends and the disability became very minor, usually, although the woman who works at NASA said that it was hard when people did not understand about cerebral palsy. So all kinds of things happen with my students and I'm very nosy. So I try to follow it. <laughs> so do I, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, perhaps a, a question I, I have for you, which builds on a bit on what Lorraine just mentioned, is that in some instances, the employees didn't understand the disability or had certain misperception or biases. Is there something perhaps you want to communicate to the audience and perhaps to both persons with and without disabilities who are watching on what you would like them to know, especially as, as a young graduate who's now gone on uh, to really pursue an exciting career within a big corporation, which involves really sophisticated work and operating within a bureaucracy and within a system, just kind of something you'd like to um, communicate about what you would like them to know about persons with disabilities. Well, yeah, like um, I I have um, a dyspraxia, which is a coordination dis disability, and um, it's more to do with um, my balance isn't very good, and um, I wobble a lot, like um, I can't walk in a straight line, like so. Um, yeah, like but in my team in EY, they have all been accepting of who I am. 
as a person. They haven't talked, uh, they haven't even mentioned my disability. They haven't even talked about my disability. They just taught us me as a person. Absolutely. Uh, which I think that's really key, um, Robin, because I think, you know, it's to see everybody as as who they are rather than, you know, whatever ability or disability they might have. So to focus on, you know, focus on Stephen's incredible strengths and, you know, to really what we do as well as when we're organizing the placements and the internships is we try and give a bit of a, um, you know, a feel for what type of things they like, you know, like Stephen is a big soccer fan, for example, that was very important to make sure the team knew which team, right? <laughs> Monday night. <laughs> and, um, you know, if someone has a particular interest in film or in, you know, in, in a different kind of sport, but it just helps to, to see the complete person and take the focus away from the fact that there is a disability. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, there, there are jobs that suit everybody. And it's just to kind of find the right match for somebody and to support them. And as Stephen said, his mentors were so, um, so valuable and so helpful to him. You know, there is a whole body system within EY that, that they, they, they know that that is key to the success of, of everything, of helping someone to settle in. And that's not just somebody with a disability, that's everybody. Um, you know, to ensure that they're welcomed into the organisation, and uh, it is a you know, as Stephen said, just to 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 look at the person as a person yeah. first, and so and you know, figure out how to do it. Really, what I gather from what you've told me, Stephen and and Lorene and Marie, is that we should really paint a three dimensional picture for every individual candidate, understand the role mentorship has to play, understand the role cultural bonds especially informal, be it in your favorite soccer team, your, your favorite band, and really to bring that all together and cater it and customize it according to the individual and to present him as a multi-dimensional, interesting, diverse person. And then more or less, as you said, Stephen, you know, people then tend to forget and about the disability and it kind of drifts into the background and they accept you as the valuable team member you are no different than someone with or without a disability and uh, I think the one thing I, I have to disagree on with Stephen is his favorite choice of a soccer team <laughs> but that that is fine we won't mention that here that's not the time but uh, no all, all, in all seriousness Stephen thank you for joining us and, and sharing your story today I think it really um, adds a valuable end to the conversation we had about career entry points for persons with disabilities. And I think your story will carry on into our conference of especially one of perseverance and just putting yourself out there and um, being acceptive of the team and vice versa. And I think it really reflects on what you bring to the equation. And I think with, as long as we ha have people such as Laureen and Marie and doing great work with their programs, um, we're only gonna have more and more success stories to talk about. and be able to fill entire days of conferences when we talk about persons with disabilities. So on that note, thank you very much everyone for joining us today. I think this officially concludes day one of the Zero Project Conference and um, please join us um, on, for, on Thursday and on Friday, February 11 and February 12 of day two and uh, day three of the ZeroCon 21 conference. Good night. Good night, thank you. Good night. Thanks.